Dzień dobry, witam serdecznie w kolejnym odcinku programu English Breakfast Extra. Dziś kolejny wyjątkowy gość i tak się składa, że kolejny gość z zagranicy, ale za to bardzo zacny gość. Mój gość jest autorem książki, takiej oto książki, Jurgen Klopp, robimy hałas, wiadomo z czym to się wiąże. Robimy hałas, czyli gramy taką piłkę, o której wszyscy mówią, którą wszyscy zapamiętają, w której jest dużo goli i to, to nie jest klasyczna autobiografia, jest to książka napisana, jest to portret Klopa nakreślony oczami innych ludzi, z tymi wszystkimi ludźmi spotkał się i porozmawiał. Rafael Henigstein, is it, is it good or not? My German is good? It's very good, yeah. It's very good. Oh, where's my English breakfast? Uh, later, after, no. after, the, after the show, because we can't cook it here on Krakowskie Przedmieście. Rafael, my first question is about about Jurgen Klopp, of course, but it's uh, it's like, did you meet someone who doesn't like Klopp? It was very difficult to find people who don't like Klopp. I was a bit worried because it got a little bit uh, one-dimensional. I was afraid that everyone says he's amazing, he's amazing. Uh, there are one or two people that I knew he had fallen out with at the end of his Dortmund career. But even they still said, two years later, actually I really like him. So um, it was very, very difficult to get anyone to say anything negative at all. I had one colleague of mine who had quite a few colleagues, um, you know, journalists who didn't really get on with him. But uh, they were also reluctant to say anything bad because it was a professional, if you, if you want, disagreement. But when they were thinking about him, Objectively, they would still say, actually, he's a really good coach and what he does makes sense, etc., etc. So there are some, I think, some insights, especially in the Dortmund section about the last year where you could see that he did make mistakes. He is not flawless. He was not always fair, at least not uh, the way he talked to, to other journalists, for example. But the bottom line is, I think that they still respect him and look up to him and feel that he is, um, he is always welcome if he were to come back. And I think that's the most important thing, that he manages to finish with people uh, in a spot where they can still see eye to eye and still get on. You are painting his picture uh, with small small pictures. Which which situation, which scene from the book is your favorite one? Uh, that is really difficult to answer. I mean, I really like. Um, all his earlier stuff, I like his uh, uh, his collect recollections from when he was at school, when he was doing German comedy, t he was listening to German comedy tapes and then explaining, uh, doing jokes and doing theatre. He was apparently in a theatre uh, group in school and you can see him being an actor and you can see him telling these kind of lame but at the same time funny jokes from the 70s. You know? <laughs> um, uh, But I mean, I, I don't know. It's a little bit like you ask you you, you know you ask uh, somebody who's your favorite uh, daughter, or your favorite son. You have kind of <laughs> it's difficult to uh, to choose. But the chapter, and this is not so much about Kopp, but the chapter I enjoyed most uh, working on was actually the chapter on Wolfgang Frank, who is um, the, maybe the most important person in his professional life, who had a huge influence on him and on German football. But I enjoyed it so much because many people know the story of Jürgen Klopp or know the vague, the vague story of it or the basics. But Wolfgang Frank is still uh, a little bit of an unknown quantity, even in German football. And I wanted to almost write a tribute to him. And you did it. And I, yeah, thank you. Um, as the way I see it, like his footballing father. He had a real father, of course, who was very important and he had a football father and I think this book if you read it sort of between the lines is also a book not just about football but also a book about fathers and sons and uh, it was important for me to get the Wolfgang Frank chapter right. 
and there is a speech from Jurgen Klopp during his funeral and it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, it's very moving. Um, according to somebody who was there, it was the toughest speech he ever had to do. You know, Jurgen never takes note, never prepares. He always just comes out with all the stuff and people are like, oh, wow. Um, but I think this one was very, very hard for him to put into words. I think he managed it beautifully. I think everyone cried, uh, not just him when he, when he spoke. But yeah, I think it was one of those occasions that, uh, that shows you just what kind of guy he is because it would have been easy just to say, you know, we leave that to the sons or we leave that to the family, but he felt, he felt it was his duty to pay respect to his mentor and um, as you'd expect he did it in a, in a very moving way. And if you look on the way he, he, he needed to rebel, uh, re rebuild Liverpool, uh, Jurgen Klopp, from the defence, from the defence, the deep, good defence, it's like something uh, which, you, which you need in every team and it was from Wolfgang Frank I think because he started to build a team uh, from the back. Yeah, I mean Wolfgang Frank's big idea at the time was to play without a sweeper, to play with zonal marking rather than man marking, which was still the fashion at the time in Germany in the mid-90s in the second Bundesliga. And uh, then to use the time that you have, because you're no longer man marking, to use that extra time in theory that you have to actually press the ball. That's the big idea. Now, today, of course, it's no longer a novelty. Most good teams, even most bad teams, try to play a variety of that. But at the time, it made a huge, huge difference. And yes, I would say it was, uh, in essence, a defensive mechanism. But it had a very positive effect because most teams didn't know how to deal with it, lost the ball, and then were very, very open. And even with pretty bad players, Mainz managed to somehow be competitive and suddenly for the first time ever fight for promotion in the Bundesliga. That was the big effect under Wolfgang Frank. And when Klopp took over in 2001, he brought those ideas back and immediately Mainz went from relegation candidate to being very <laughs> nearly promoted twice and then at the third time they managed it. Again with a team that player by player shouldn't have really been in the Bundesliga at all. He took that one step further with Dortmund, or quite a few steps further with Dortmund, and now, of course, he's trying to replicate that at, at Liverpool, but with a team that is, um, I think, the best team he's ever had, and a team that also had to adjust because in 2018, this is no longer this brand new idea, uh, and other teams know or are trying to find ways to negate that, try to find ways to, to overcome that. So. He had to develop a lot and I think he still adheres to the principles of his conviction and of his footballing ideas and foundations. But within that framework, there's a lot of variety and a lot of evolution and adaptation because otherwise you wouldn't be able to succeed in 2018. You told me before the interview, uh, he, he wants to write his own book when, when he will retire. And uh, it means your book, it's not with, with his participation. Uh, in your book, just other people, they, they are talking about him. What was the hardest part uh, uh, when, you, when you were preparing, researching? Well, I was very afraid that, um, because it was not an official book, that he was going to be uncooperative behind the scenes. You know, when I asked his sister, can you talk to me about Jurgen Klopp? She's never spoken to before to anyone. I was afraid that she's going to ask him and say no. And he's going to say no. I don't want you to talk. Or the same with you know Christian Heidel, ex-sporting director at Mainz, now at uh, Schalke. Or the same with Hans-Joachim Watzke at Dortmund. Or all these players. Ilkay Gundogan, who was with him for three years, he was at Manchester City. I called him up. I thought, you know, of course he's going to say yes. Why? Um, but he said, yeah, okay, I want to do it, but I want to first talk to Klopp and see if, if it's okay. So I was worried that A, he is going to shut the project down effectively and B, that when, he, when I wrote it, 
he was going to look at it and said, yeah, it's great, but it's all rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately for me, he was hugely helpful and said yes to everyone and really was very cooperative in a passive way. And secondly, when I gave him the finished book, uh, a week later I heard from his agent that he loved the book and then I saw him two, days, two weeks later and he said, just wanted to tell you, I laughed a lot, I enjoyed it, it brought back a lot of stories that I had forgotten, thank you very much. So was no, it wasn't like, was it's not that true, it's not that true what you are writing about, it, it, it wasn't like this. No, no, it was the opposite. He said, uh, I'd forgotten all these stories. It's so funny. Thanks for, uh, for writing that again. And of course, you know, I think he's smart enough to know that the people that work with him, the people that uh, know him, the overwhelming majority of them like him. So they're, gonna, they're not going to say bad things about me. And oh, it's easier for someone who, who writes a book. I don't know if it's easier, but I think it, it's maybe more true and more, maybe more compelling to have 50 people give you an idea of a person rather than the person giving you an idea of himself and just writing about how this wonderful coaching and how he's such a brilliant guy. <laughs> um, it would have been great, but in a way it, I had more freedom, uh, much more freedom to be independent and I think also it is maybe more convincing to hear it from other people rather than from himself. So I think it's the negative or the disadvantage of not having his direct participation. I tried to turn it into, into an advantage. Hopefully I succeeded. For me, there is uh, one scene I, I told you before, before our interview, uh, which describes um, Klopp in the best way. Uh, it's all about negotiations in New York between him and Liverpool, uh, negotiations about his contract. And he was, during the negotiations, he was in Central Park probably, yeah. because he, he, he didn't want to participate in, about the money. Yeah, about the money. Yeah. And they, are fina they, they finally agreed. And uh, he got a message from this guy, Gordon, uh, from from uh, John W. Henry, uh, a guy from John, John W. Henry, and it, it's really nice to have you on board and stuff like this, typical corporate stuff. And the answer from Klopp was, wow. <laughs> and for me, it's typical Klopp. It's the, yeah. it's the best thing in this book for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're right. Um, Mike Gordon writes in this lovely uh, text saying, words cannot explain how excited I am to work with you. <laughs> yeah. And Klopp says, um, also, I'm struggling to find the right words, but I have one word. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite funny. But I think that whole episode with him going to New York is funny because it could really be some kind of comedy um, <laughs> because it's supposed to be all top secret because Brendan Rodgers is still in charge. But uh, from the very moment that Klopp leaves Munich, already in Munich he's being recognized in the lounge, in Lufthansa lounge. They're saying to him, what are you doing in uh, New York? I'm going to see the game in NBA League. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no NBA. Well, it hasn't started, it will start in four weeks. That was not a great, uh, a great excuse. And then of course he checks into his hotel in New York and as coincidence, would have it, the guy in New York who checks him in is from Mainz and says, oh, the Kloppo, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> but somehow it didn't leak uh, and uh, of course the rest is history. He had some really big offers like Manchester United, Liverpool, uh, Tottenham and also Manchester City, so a big choice. Why he decided to go for Liverpool, uh, how do you think? Well, I think first of all the timing was right. Um, Man United came in uh, in April 2014. He still felt he, his job wasn't finished at Dortmund. He was reluctant to leave. Also, he felt that Man United not... I think he didn't really trust uh, the people in charge there so much. Um, didn't really believe, get excited by, by the project that much. Ed Woodward said something like, uh, it's, a Disney, it's a Disneyland for adults. Yeah. It's not the greatest sales pitch, I think, but 
uh, I think with different timing he might have taken the job. I don't think that you can necessarily say it was only Liverpool for him or nothing. I think it's always a combination of meeting the people, um, listening to their vision, having for yourself the right timing. It wasn't the ideal timing either because he wanted to actually take the whole year out and have a sabbatical. But I think as soon as there was a possibility that Brendan Rodgers might not stay in the job, I think everyone in Liverpool and certainly a lot of people in the circle of Klopp felt that this is actually the perfect match in theory because so many things that Klopp brings to the table uh, were exactly what Liverpool needed at the time. And I think also Klopp needed a club like Liverpool to work the way he wants to work with the passion, with the emotion, with people. I think people are often very, very important. And Liverpool offers you offers you all of that. So I think it was a great match, is a great match. He cares about people. Uh, we could see it in, in Dortmund when he phoned to people, to people's houses, uh, to trying to to tell come come to the stadium, uh, come and watch the game, especially for uh, uh, for the VIP launches because um, some guys that they were not decided uh, if if they can go for for another season uh, because they were struggling in the league and and he he was trying to persuade people to to, to come to the stadium. For for me, it was something really strange. Yeah, and it's again, it's like typical Jurgen Klopp. I mean, just phoning up the, uh, phoning up the corporate clients and say, "Hi, this is Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> Have you bought your ticket? <laughs> Have you bought your lounge?" But I think Dortmund realized very soon that this is going to be the big difference. I mean, they even put up, uh, you know, big ads with his face saying, "Buy the new season ticket," because I think they realized that people would put their hopes into more fun, more exciting football, into this guy, that he was going to really take Dortmund from this mid-table, staleness, anonymity, boring football, and make it fun again, make it exciting again. And of course, having done that with Mainz, with Dortmund, and now doing it at Liverpool, shows you that that belief was was justified, and I think Liverpool already are feeling that this is the, the, the right guy and they have real deep, kind of deep con confidence in what he does, which goes beyond, I think, winning trophies one year or the next year. I think there's a sense that this is the right guy for the job, which is bigger than anything else. Was it difficult to write about his relationship with, with, with father? Uh, because it's it it was some um, it was big love i think uh, his father really loved him but uh, not in a typical way yeah. uh, they uh, he was he was challenging young young jurgen all the time uh, it was tennis or or skiing or football everything he was challenging his him all the time uh, and it was for me it was really nice yeah, I mean, it was it was good, it was nice to write, but I was happy that I wasn't uh, treated by my dad that way. Um, <laughs> I mean, ultimately, you could say that it, it worked and it it formed his character and it uh, instilled that sporting ambition and that sporting madness that he certainly has from his dad. But it looks hard. It looks harsh, yeah. I mean, getting up at like six in the morning to play tennis against you know grown-up man who's beat you six nil, six nil. It doesn't. It's not my idea of fun. Um, but I think, I think he he realized that that was just from his generation, his dad's generation. Maybe they couldn't really express their feelings um, and their love to their children in the way that that he and and our generation can. It was just a different way of showing showing your love and support and I think he showed it by by in inverted commas torturing him in all sorts of sports that's what he enjoyed and that's what he wants to do and I think ultimately Jürgen was very very proud that he managed to succeed in the area that his dad always wanted him to succeed. What's the biggest difference between Jürgen Klopp from Mainz uh, from the very beginning when he suddenly is, uh, is a coach of the first team and and Jurgen Klopp from now in, in Liverpool? 
it's massive. I mean, it's 18 years difference or 17 years difference. And of course, he's a completely different manager now. He's a guy with experience. He's a guy who um, has learned to adapt to different surroundings. Now he coaches abroad, which brings extra challenges. You know, learning to get to grips with the Premier League and it's crazy rhythm and strange referees and all these weird things that you have. Um, he is a much more rounded, much more developed and sophisticated coach as a result. In 2001, he didn't really know what he, what he was doing. Um, he had some ideas. He had, I think, a talent even then to talk to players. But he is a much better coach now. And he had to be because if he was still the Jurgen Klopp from 2001 now turning up at Liverpool and say, OK, this is what we're going to do, I don't think it would work because time, times have changed, things have moved on and he needed to adapt and uh, keep developing to be to stay on the cutting edge. And he told England is, is my place because I need my language to, to cooperate with players, to, uh, to tell them what I want from them and it was really important for him to, to go to England. Yes, uh, when I asked him um, in an interview I did for BT Sport if he was going to go to the Premier League after his Dortmund time, that was in November 2014, he immediately said, yes, yes, I'm going to the Premier League. I thought, oh, that's a straight answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, but as you said, he explained that he really felt that there was no other place for him to go because of the language issue. I think actually he's not entirely honest here because I know that he studied French in school and spent some time there on uh, holidays and on, on exchange, school exchange. So his French is probably better than he, uh, than he lets on. But I can understand why he feels the language is so important for him that English, which is his sort of second best language, was always going to be the natural uh, way to communicate at the next, at the next club. So. Um, it shows you that I think for him connecting with, with people is, is really what coaching is about. I think for him it's not about um, the technical side because that is important, the idea side is important, but without the human side none of these ideas would work. It's only because you get people to believe in you as a person and in the idea then as a secondary consequence that you can get them to perform. And that happens through personal connections. Liverpool is waiting for the title for so long, so long time. And do you think he's the right person to, to bring it back to, to Anfield? I think he's the best possible manager for Liverpool. Whether that's enough to win the Premier League in a league with Guardiola and Man City, I'm not sure. Um, it's his big misfortune that for the second time in his uh, short career, because I'm not counting now Mainz, where he never had a chance to win anything um, in the first division. Um, it's his misfortune that he's up against Guardiola for the second time. But Liverpool are getting closer and I don't think you can do much more than making your team competitive and give them a realistic chance to win stuff and he's doing that and he's he's done it with a team that a few years ago people would have said absolutely no chance they can win the title with this with this team with this setup that they have yes they had that one season where it almost happened but it looked very quickly like it was just a, a near miracle it didn't look like it was a sustainable thing that every year they could challenge they certainly didn't I think now we're getting into an area and into an era where Liverpool can start every season in the knowledge that we have a realistic chance of, of winning. And I think that is already big progress compared to recent history. And the very last question, it's, about, it's not about Jurgen Klopp. Um, my guests, they are answering for, for the question like four of a kind, four aces from Premier League. One goalkeeper, one defender, one midfielder, and one forward striker, as you wish, uh, in the Premier League era. So, the floor is yours. 
Okay, so one goalkeeper from the Premier League area. Uh, you have to tell, of course, why. Of course. Um, Premier League do usually doesn't have that good, many good goalkeepers compared to... You can find one. <laughs> so you can find one or two. Um, I'm going to go for Peter Cech. Not the Peter Cech of 2018, but the Peter Cech of the Chelsea years. I think he was, at that time, the number one or number two in the world. And the defender? Defender... There's a recency bias that you always want to immediately pick sort of the, the guys from right now. And it's hard almost not to say Van Dijk because he's so imposing. Uh, so I'm thinking if I can go for someone a bit more interesting. Um, you can go back even to 90s. Yeah, no, 90s <laughs> defending in a Premier League. No. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, by the way, you know, whenever you see Gary Neville talk about, oh, they don't know how to defend anymore, just watch five minutes of highlights from <laughs> the 90s, or even from, you know, even Ferguson's better teams. Rubbish. Rubbish compared to today's defending. Okay, so one of the best defenders. Um, it's usually between Rio Ferdinand and John Terry when, when people no, are thinking about defender. No, I like Rio. Uh, I don't like John Terry for many reasons. Um, I'm going to say Yap Stam. But it's a short period of yeah, but, it, it, but it's something different. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> and midfielder. Midfielder. Oh, that, this, is, this is really difficult. Uh, really, really difficult. I must admit I'm in love with Kevin De Bruyne. Uh, not off the pitch. I'm happily married, but uh, as a player, he's amazing. So Kevin De Bruyne. It's only about the pitch. <laughs> exactly. So forward or striker? Forward or striker? Mm. It's kind of hard not to say Alan Shearer. It's simply because of the goals and the amount of Statistics. Goals. Yes, and he scored it at teams that weren't really that good. Um, okay, Blackbird had a you know good spell, but actually... It uh, wasn't Arsenal or Manchester United. Exactly. But best ever that I've seen is probably Thierry Henry. Thierry Henry. That's my favorite one. Uh, Alan Shearer. But Thierry Henry, you can, you can use him as a midfielder also. No, you can't. No. You can. He played on the left, but really he was a he was a striker that started. If you wanna put Shearer and Thierry Henry in one team, you have to do it. Uh, not really. I mean, at Arsenal they played a four-four-two, and he was one of the two strikers, just starting always slightly on the left to cut inside. But also, maybe not the same impact as him, but in terms of real talent, uh, Bergkamp did some absolutely magical things, and I think he also has a special place in my heart. So the very, very last question. Uh, three best coaches in the world, best managers in the world in your opinion now at the moment. Oh, I think that's pretty easy. Um, Guardiola, uh, Klopp and uh, Sarri. And Sarri. Yeah. So this is a thin three for, for Premier League this season. Yeah, and this is the Premier League's big strength over the last two years, two, three years or so, that they started not just buying good players, but buying the best coaches. And that's made a massive difference. Uh, perhaps hasn't made that much difference in the Champions League yet that we expected it. But I think we're getting closer to the point where English teams will once again uh, also dominate in Europe like they did uh, you know, in 2007, 2008, when you had three teams in the last four a couple of times. Uh, that is where the Premier League really becomes very exciting. The quality on the benches um, is, is outstanding. Uh, and like the quality of the top teams, has the biggest depth, I'd say, of quality at the very top. So, yeah, those three, for me, are the best at the moment. Thank you very much Thank for you. being my guest and have a nice stay in Warsaw. Ja pokażę raz jeszcze tę książkę. 
Rafael Henigstein. Jest autorem książki Jürgen Klopp. Robimy hałas. Warto ją naprawdę przeczytać, bo to jest, to jest świetna rzecz. Jest świetnie nakreślony portret Jurgena Klopa i nie boję się tego powiedzieć z pełną odpowiedzialnością, że, że będziecie Państwo zadowoleni. To, to nie jest reklama złej książki, absolutnie na coś takiego bym się nie porwał. To jest książka, z której dowiecie się, kim jest Jurgen Klopp. Zresztą tak jak słyszeliście, autor powiedział, że nawet Jurgen Klopp jest wdzięczny za to, że przypomniał sobie wiele historii ze swojego życia. To wszystko w tym odcinku English Request Extra. Ja zapraszam serdecznie na kolejne, a na dzisiaj powolutku będziemy się już żegnać. Thank you.